Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel. If this is your first time here, we know you will enjoy the programming. So hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to make sure that you don't miss out on any future episodes. During the 1930s, the world suffered from the effects of uh, the Great Depression. And during this time, normal everyday people lost everything and blame politicians and mostly bankers for the woes that they currently endured. Out of this hatred came the Robin Hoods, the people who would normally be seen as criminals. But during this time, they were seen as a way for the common man to gain revenge against those that bankrupted their families and their friends. This is the story of one of those famous folk heroes. One of the most infamous gangsters of the early 1930s, John Herbert Dillinger was born June 22, 1903 in the Oak Hill section of Indianapolis, Indiana. The younger of two children, born to John Wilson Dillinger and Mary Ellen Molly Lancaster. Dillinger's father was a grocer by trade and reportedly a harsh man. In an interview with reporters, Dillinger said he was firm in his discipline and believed in the adage, spare the rod and spoil the child. Dillinger's oldest sister, Audrey, was born March 6, 1889. Their mother died in 1907, just before his fourth birthday. Audrey married Emmett Fred Hancock that year, and they had seven children together. She cared for her brother John for several years until their father remarried in 1912 to Elizabeth Lizzie Fields. Initially, Dillinger disliked his stepmother, but reportedly eventually became to love her. As a teenager, Dillinger was frequently in trouble with the law for fighting and petty theft. He was also noted for his bewildering personality and bullying of smaller children. He quit school to work in an Indianapolis machine shop. Although he worked hard at his job, he would stay out all night at parties. His father feared that the city was corrupting his son, prompting him to move the family to Mooresville, Indiana in about 1920. Dillinger's wild and rebellious behavior was resilient, despite his new rural life. He was arrested in 1922 for auto theft and his relationship with his father deteriorated. His troubles led him to enlist in the United States Navy, where he was a fireman third class assigned aboard the battleship USS Utah. But he deserted a few months later when his ship was docked in Boston. He was eventually dishonorably discharged. Dillinger then returned to Mooresville, where he met Beryl Ethel Hovius. The two were married on April 12, 1924. Now, he attempted to settle down, but he had difficulty holding a job and preserving his marriage. The marriage ended in divorce on June 20, 1929. Dillinger was unable to find a job and began planning a robbery with his friend Ed Singleton. The two robbed a local grocery store, stealing 50 bucks. Leaving the scene, they were spotted by a minister who recognized the men and reported them to the police. The two men were arrested the next day. Now, Singleton pleaded not guilty, but after Dillinger's father, the local Mooresville church deacon, discussed the matter with Morgan County Prosecutor Omar O'Hara, his father convinced Dillinger to confess to the crime and plead guilty without retaining a defense attorney. Dillinger was convicted of assault and battery with intent to rob and conspiracy to commit a felony. He expected a lenient sentence, but instead, he was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison for his crimes. His father told reporters he regretted his advice and was appalled by the sentence. 
He pleaded with the judge to shorten the sentence, but with no success. Dillinger had embraced the criminal lifestyle behind bars in the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. Upon being admitted to the prison, he's quoted as saying, I will be the meanest bastard you ever saw when I get out of here. His physical examination upon being admitted to the prison showed that he had gonorrhea. Now, the treatment for this condition is extremely painful. He became embittered against society because of his long prison sentence and befriended other criminals, such as seasoned bank robbers like Harry Pete Pierpont, Charles Mackley, Russell Clark, and Homer Van Meter, who taught Dillinger how to become a successful criminal. The men planned heists that they would commit soon after they were released. His father launched a campaign to have him released and was able to get 188 signatures on a petition. Dillinger was paroled on May 10, 1933 after serving only nine and a half years. Dillinger's stepmother became sick just before he was released from prison. She died before he was able to make it home. Released at the height of the Great Depression, Dillinger had little prospect to find an employment. He immediately returned to crime and on June 21, 1933, he robbed his first bank, taking down $10,000 from the New Carlisle National Bank, which occupied the building which still stands at the southeast corner of Main Street and Jefferson in New Carlisle, Ohio. On August 14, Dillinger robbed a bank in Bluffton, Ohio. Tracked by police from Dayton, Ohio, he was captured and later transferred to the Allen County Jail in Lima to be indicted in connection to the Bluffton robbery. After searching him before letting him into prison, the police discovered a document which appeared to be a prison escape plan. They demanded Dillinger tell them what the document meant, but he didn't tell them nothing. Dillinger had helped conceive a plan for the escape of Pierpont, Clark, and six others he had met while previously in prison, most of whom worked in the prison laundry. Dillinger had friends smuggle guns into their prison cells, with which they escaped four days after Dillinger's capture. The group known as the First Dillinger Gang comprised Pete Pierpont, Russell Clark, Charles Mackley, Ed Schuess, Harry Copeland, and John Red Hamilton, a member of the Herman Lamb Gang. Pierpont, Clark, and Mackley arrived in Lima on October 12th, where they impersonated Indiana State Police officers, claiming they had come to extradite Dillinger to Indiana. When the sheriff, Jess Sarber, asked for their credentials, Pierpont shot him dead, then released Dillinger from his cell. The four men escaped back into Indiana, where they joined the rest of the gang. Sheriff Sauber was the gang's first police killing of an estimated 13 lawmen deaths by the Dillinger gang members. Dillinger was finally caught by Matthew Matt Leach, the Indiana Police State Chief, and imprisoned within the Crown Point Jail sometime after committing a robbery at a bank located in East Chicago on January 15, 1934. The police boasted to area newspapers that the jail was escape-proof and posted extra guards just to make sure. What happened on the day of Dillinger's escape on March 3rd is still open to debate. Deputy Ernest Blunk claimed that Dillinger had escaped using a real pistol, but FBI files make clear that Dillinger carved a fake pistol from a potato. Sam Cahoon, a trustee that Dillinger first took hostage in the jail, believed that Dillinger had carved a gun with a razor and some shelving in his cell. However, according to an unpublished interview with Dillinger's attorney, Louis Paquette, and his investigator, Art O'Leary, O'Leary claimed to have sneaked the gun in himself. After escaping from Crown Point, Dillinger reunited with his girlfriend, Evelyn Billy Frechette, just hours after his escape at her half-sister Patsy's Chicago apartment, where she was also staying. Frechette and Dillinger met a few years earlier, and Dillinger became smitten. According to Billy's trial testimony, Dillinger stayed with her there for almost two weeks, but the two actually had traveled to the Twin Cities and moved into the Santa Monica Apartments Unit 106, 3252 South Gerard Avenue, Minneapolis on March 4th, moving out on March 19th. They met up with Hamilton, who had been recovering for the past month from his gunshot wounds in the East Chicago robbery. 
and mustered a new gang. And the two joined Babyface Nelson's gang, composed of Homer Van Meter, Tommy Carroll, and Eddie Green. Three days after Dillinger's escape from Crown Point, the second Dillinger gang robbed the bank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. A week later, they robbed First National Bank in Mason City, Iowa. Dillinger and Billy eventually moved into apartment 303 at a Lincoln Court Apartments, 9395 South Lexington Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota on Tuesday, March 20th, using the aliases Mr. and Mrs. Carl T. Hellman. The three-story apartment complex, still in operation, had 32 apartments, 10 units on each floor, and two basement units. Daisy Coffee, the landlord owner, would testify at Frechette's trial that she spent most evenings during the Hellman stay furnishing apartment 310, which enabled her to observe what was happening in apartment 303 directly across the courtyard. The building was placed under surveillance by two agents, Rufus Coulter and Rusty Knowles, that night, but they saw nothing unusual, mainly due to the blinds being drawn. The next morning at approximately 10.15, Knowles circled around the block looking for a new Hudson automobile, rumored to be Dillinger's new car, but he didn't see nothing. He parked first on Lincoln, the north side of the apartments, then on the west side of Lexington at the northwest corner of Lexington and Lincoln and remained in his car while watching Coulter and St. Paul Police Detective Henry Cummings pull up, pack, and enter the building. Ten minutes later, by Nall's estimate, Van Meter parked the Green Ford Coupe on the north side of the apartment building. Meanwhile, Coulter and Cummings knocked on the door of apartment 303. Frechette answered, opening the door only two to three inches. She said she wasn't dressed and to come back later. Coulter said they'd wait. After waiting two to three minutes, Coulter went to the basement apartment of the caretakers, Lewis and Margaret Meindlinger, and asked to use the phone to call the bureau. He quickly returned to Cummings, and the two men waited for Frechette to open the door. Van Meter then appeared in the hall and asked Coulter if his name was Johnson. Coulter said it was not, and as Van Meter passed on the landing of the third floor, Coulter asked him for his name. Van Meter said, I'm a soap salesman. Asked where his samples were, Van Meter said, out there in his car. Now, Coulter asked if he had any credentials. Van Meter said, no, and continued down the stairs. Coulter waited 10 to 20 seconds and followed Van Meter. As Coulter got to the lobby on the ground floor, Van Meter opened fire on him. Coulter hastily fled outside, chased by Van Meter. Eventually, Van Meter ran back into the front entrance. Recognizing Van Meter, Knowles pointed out the Ford to Coulter and told him to disable it. So Coulter shot out the left rear tire. While Coulter stayed with Van Meter's Ford, Knowles went to the corner drugstore and called first the local police, then the Bureau's St. Paul office, but couldn't get through because both lines were busy. Van Meter, meanwhile, escaped by hopping on a passing coal truck. Dillinger then stepped out and fired another burst at Cummings. Cummings shot back with a revolver but quickly ran out of ammunition. He hit Dillinger on the left calf with one of his five shots, though, and then hastily retreated down the stairs to the front entrance. Once Cummings retreated, Dillinger and Frechette hurried down the stairs, exited through the back door, and drove away in the Hudson. The couple drove to the apartment of Eddie Green at 3300 South Fremont in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Green called his associate, Dr. Clayton E. May, at his office in Minneapolis, 712 Masonic Temple. With Green, his wife Beth, and Frechette following in Green's car, Dr. May drove Dillinger to 1835 Park Avenue, Minneapolis, to the apartment of Augusta Salt who had been providing nursing services and a bed for May's illicit patients for several years, patients he could not risk seeing at his regular office. May treated Dillinger's wound with antiseptics. Eddie Green visited Dillinger on Monday, April 2nd, just hours before Green would be mortally wounded by the FBI in St. Paul. Dillinger convalesced at Dr. May's for five days until Wednesday, April 4th, Dr. May was promised $500 for his services, but he didn't get nothing. After leaving Minneapolis, Dillinger and Billy traveled to Mooresville to visit Dillinger's father. 
Friday, April 6th, was spent contacting family members, particularly his half-brother, Hubert Dillinger. On April 6th, Hubert and Dillinger left Mooresville at about 8 p.m. and proceeded to Leipzig, Ohio, about 210 miles away, to see Joseph and Lena Pierpont, Harry's parents. But the Pierponts were not home, so the two headed back to Mooresville around midnight. On April 7th at approximately 3.30 in the morning, they rammed a car driven by Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Manning near Noblesville, Indiana, after Hubert fell asleep behind the wheel. They crashed through a farm fence and about 200 feet into the woods. Now, both men made it back to the Mooresville farm, but swarms of police showed up at the accident scene within hours. Found in the car, they had maps, a machine gun magazine, a length of rope, and a bullwhip. According to Hubert, his brother planned to pay a visit with his bullwhip to his former one-armed shyster lawyer at Crown Point, Joseph Ryan, who'd run off with his retainer after being replaced by Louis Paquette. At about 10.30 in the morning on April 7th, Billy, Hubert, and Hubert's wife purchased a black four-door Ford V8, registering it in the name of Mrs. Fred Penfield. It's Billy Frechette. At 2.30 p.m., Billy and Hubert picked up the V8 and returned to Mooresville. On Sunday, April 8th, the Dillingers enjoyed a family picnic while the FBI had the farm under surveillance nearby. Later in the afternoon, suspecting they were being watched, the agents J.L. Garrity and T.J. Donegan were cruising in the vicinity of their car. So the group left in separate cars. Billy drove the new Ford V8 with two of Dillinger's nieces, Mary Hancock in the front seat and Alberta Hancock in the back. Dillinger was on the floor of the car. He was later seen but not recognized by Donegan and Garrity. Eventually, Norman, driving the V8, proceeded with Dillinger and Billy to Chicago, where they separated from Norman. The following afternoon, Monday, April 9th, Dillinger had an appointment at a tavern at 416 North State Street. Now, since in trouble, Billy went in first. She was promptly arrested by agents, but refused to reveal Dillinger's whereabouts. Now, Dillinger was waiting in the car outside the tavern, and he drove off unnoticed. The two would never see each other again. Dillinger reportedly became despondent after Billy was arrested. The other gang members tried to talk him out of rescuing her, but Van Meenan knew where they could find some bulletproof vests. That Friday morning, late at night, Dillinger and Van Meter took Warsaw, Indiana police officer Judd Bittinger hostage. They marched him at gunpoint to the police station where they stole several more guns and the bulletproof vests. After separating, Dillinger picked up Hamilton and was recovering from the Mason City robbery. The two then traveled to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where they visited Hamilton's sister, Anna Steve. In April of 1934, Dillinger and his gang were on the run from the law once again after a couple of close calls in Chicago and Point South. Looking to lie low, the gang consisting of Homer Van Meter, John Hamilton, Pat Charrington, Tommy Carroll, and the wild card, Lester Joseph Gillis, a.k.a. Babyface Nelson, decided to hole up up north at the Little Bohemia Lodge in Manitowish Waters, Wisconsin. At the time, the woods of Wisconsin were a virtual playground for on-the-lamb gangsters looking to beat the heat in Chicago, and there are numerous stories of lodges up in Wisconsin catering to the criminally inclined with mixed results. Built and owned by Emil Wanatka, the hideout was arranged through noted syndicate attorney Louis Paquette, for a handsome fee, of course, paid by Dillinger. While the whole party enjoyed the stay, unbeknownst to them, Monatka's wife mailed a letter to Melvin Purvis and informed him and the authorities that the Dillinger gang was at the lodge. For their part, the Dillinger gang was not entirely relaxed in their safe house and remained fairly vigilant in the event law enforcement did find them. Realizing the main road into the lodge could easily be blocked off, they all agreed before the raid, with exception of Nelson, that the best escape would be to follow along the shore of the lake. Purvis would end up organizing the raid on the lodge, which in time would come to be known as the Battle of Little Bohemia. Once federal agents and local authorities opened fire, the whole area became a battle zone. Splinters of wood from the nearby trees and the lodge itself permeated the air. Dillinger made his escape through the back, although the gun battle continued to rage, covering Dillinger's escape. 
He followed the plan originally agreed to by the gang and ran down to the back of the lake shore and turned right. Although Dillinger had already made his getaway, Purvis and the other agents believed the gangster to still be in the lodge. Turns out he commandeered a Ford coupe owned by a carpenter who stayed at a local residence close to the lodge. By July 1934, Dillinger had dropped completely out of sight, and the federal agents had no solid leads to follow. He had, in fact, drifted into Chicago, where he went under the alias of Jimmy Lawrence, a petty criminal from Wisconsin who bore a close resemblance to Dillinger. Working as a clerk, Dillinger found that in a large metropolis like Chicago, he was able to lead an anonymous existence for a while. What he did not realize was that the center of the federal agent's dragnet happened to be in Chicago. When the authorities found Dillinger's blood-spattered getaway car on a Chicago side street, they were positive that he was in the city. Dillinger had always been a fan of the Chicago Cubs, and instead of lying low like many criminals on the run, he attended Cubby's games at Wrigley Field during June and July. He's known to have been at Wrigley Field on Friday, June 8th, only to watch his beloved Cubs lose to Cincinnati 4-3. Also in attendance at the game were Dillinger's lawyer, Louis Piquette, and Captain John Steeds of the Dillinger squad. According to Art O'Leary, as early as March 1934, Dillinger expressed an interest in plastic surgery and had asked O'Leary to check with Paquette on such matters. At the end of April, Paquette paid a visit to his old friend, Dr. Wilhelm Loza. Loza had practiced in Chicago for 27 years before being convicted under the Harrison Narcotic Act in 1931. He was sentenced to three years at Leavenworth, but was paroled early on December 7, 1932, with Paquette's help. He later testified that he performed facial surgery on himself and obliterated the fingerprint impressions on the tips of his fingers by an application of a caustic soda preparation. Paquette and Dillinger would have to pay $5,000 for the plastic surgery, $4,400 split between Paquette, Lozer, and O'Leary, and $600 bucks to Dr. Harold Cassidy, who would administer the anesthetic. The procedure would take place at the home of Paquette's longtime friend, 67-year-old James Probasco, at the end of May. On May 28th, Loza was picked up at his home at 7.30 p.m. by O'Leary and Cassidy. The three of them drove to Probasco's place. Dillinger chose to have a general anesthetic. Loza later testified, I asked him what work he wanted done. He wanted two warts, moles, removed on the right lower forehead between the eyes and one at the left angle, outer angle of the left eye. He wanted a depression of the nose filled in, a scar, a large one to the left of the median line of the upper lip excised, wanted his dimples removed, and wanted the angle of the mouth drawn up. He didn't say anything about the fingers that day to me. Now Cassidy administered an overdose of ether, which caused Dillinger to suffocate he began to turn blue and stop breathing. Lozer pulled Dillinger's tongue out of his mouth with a pair of forceps and at the same time forcing both elbows into his ribs. Dillinger gasped for air and finally resumed breathing. The procedure continued, but with only a local anesthetic. Lozer removed several moles on Dillinger's forehead, made an incision in his nose and an incision in his chin, and tied back both cheeks. Loza met with Paquette again on Saturday, June 2nd, with Paquette saying that more work was needed on Dillinger, and that Van Meter now wanted the same work done to him. Also, both now wanted work done on their fingertips. The price for the fingerprint job? 500 bucks a hand, or $100 a finger. Loza used a mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acid, commonly known as aqua regia. Loza testified, Cassidy and I worked on Dillinger and Van Meter simultaneously on June 3rd. While the work was being done, Dillinger and Van Meter changed off. The work that could be done while the patient was sitting up, that patient was in the sitting room. The work that had to be done while the man was lying down, that patient was on the couch in the bedroom. They were changed back and forth according to the work to be done. The hands were sterilized, made aseptic with antiseptics, thoroughly washed with soap and water, and used sterile gauze afterwards to keep them clean. Next, cutting instrument, knife, was used to expose the lower skin. 
In other words, take off the epidermis and expose the derma. Then alternately, the acid in the alkaloid was applied as was necessary to produce the desired results. Agents arrested Loza at 1127 South Harvey, Oak Park, Illinois, on Tuesday, July 24th. O'Leary returned from a family fishing trip on July 24th, the day of Loza's arrest, and had read in the newspapers that the Department of Justice was looking for two doctors and another man in connection with some plastic work that was done on Dillinger. O'Leary left Chicago immediately, but returned two weeks later, learned that Lozer and the others had been arrested, phoned Paquette, who assured him everything was all right, then left again. He returned from St. Louis on August 25th and was promptly taken into custody. On Friday, July 27th, Jimmy Probasco jumped or accidentally fell to his death from the 19th floor of the Bankers Building in Chicago while in custody. On Thursday, August 23rd, Homer Van Meter was shot and killed in a dead-end alley in St. Paul by Tom Brown, former St. Paul Chief of Police and then current Chief Frank Cullen. It was around this time that Dillinger met the female that would later accompany him to his demise, Rita Polly Hamilton, was a teenage runaway from Fargo, North Dakota. She met Anna Compianus Kilowak, a.k.a. Anna Sage in Gary, Indiana, and worked periodically as a prostitute in Anna's brothel until marrying Gary police officer Roy O'Keel in 1929. They later divorced in March of 1933. In the summer of 1934, the now 26-year-old Hamilton was a waitress in Chicago at the s and Sandwich Shop located at 1209 Wilson Avenue. She had remained friends with Sage and was sharing living space with Sage and Sage's 24-year-old son, Steve, at 2858 Clark Street. Dillinger and Hamilton, a Billy Frechette look-alike, met in June 1934 at the Barrel of Fun nightclub located at 4541 Wilson Avenue. Dillinger introduced himself as Jimmy Lawrence and said he was a clerk at the Board of Trade. Federal Investigations Chief J. Edgar Hoover created a special task force headquartered in Chicago to locate Dillinger. On July 21st, Anna Compianus, aka Anna Sage, contacted the FBI. See, she was a Romanian immigrant being threatened with deportation for low moral character and offered agents information on Dillinger in exchange for their help in preventing her deportation. The FBI agreed to her terms, but they deported her nonetheless. Compianos revealed that Dillinger was spending his time with another prostitute, Polly Hamilton, and that she and the couple would be going to see a movie together on the following day. She agreed to wear an orange dress so the police could easily identify her. She was unsure as to which of the two theaters they would be attending, the Biograph or the Marlboro. Sage stated that on Sunday afternoon, July 22nd, Dillinger asked her if she wanted to go to the show with them, he and Polly. She asked him what show he was going to see, and he said he would like to see the theater around the corner, meaning the Biograph Theater. She stated later she was unable to leave the house to inform Purvis and Martin about Dillinger's plan to attend the Biograph. But since they were going to have fried chicken for the evening meal, she told Polly she had nothing in which to fry that chicken and was going to the store to get some butter. While at the store, she called Purvis and informed him of Dillinger's plans to attend the biograph that evening. She also grabbed some butter. She then returned to the house so Polly would not be suspicious that she went out to call anyone. A team of federal agents and officers from police forces from outside of Chicago was formed, along with a very small number of Chicago police officers. Among them was Sergeant Martin Zakovich, the officer to whom Sage had acted as an informant. At the time, federal officials felt that the Chicago police had been compromised and therefore could not be trusted. Hoover and Purvis also wanted more to credit. Not wanting to take the risk of another embarrassing escape of Dillinger, the police were split into two groups. On Sunday, one team was sent to the Marlboro Theater on the city's west side, while another team surrounded the Biograph Theater at 2433 North Lincoln Avenue on the north side. Sage, Hamilton, and Dellinger were observed entering the Biograph at approximately 8.30 p.m., which ironically was showing the crime drama 
Manhattan Melodrama, starring Clark Gable, Manny Loy, and William Powell. When Dillinger was in the theater, Samuel P. Cowley, the lead agent, contacted J. Edgar Hoover for instructions. He recommended they wait outside rather than risk a gun battle within the theater. He told the agents not to put themselves in harm's way and that any man could open fire on Dillinger at the first sign of resistance. During the stakeout, the Biograph's manager thought the agents were criminals setting up a robbery. He called the Chicago police, who dutifully responded and had to be waved off by federal agents who told them that they were on a stakeout for an important target. When the film ended, Purvis stood by the front door and signaled Dillinger's exit to the other agents by lighting a cigar. Both he and the other agents reported that Dillinger turned his head and looked directly at the agent as he walked by, glanced across the street, then moved ahead of his female companions, reached into his pocket but failed to extract his gun and ran into a nearby alley. Other accounts stated Dillinger ignored a command to surrender, whipped out his gun, then headed for the alley. Agents already had the alley closed off, but Dillinger was determined to shoot it out. Three men pursued Dillinger into the alley and fired. Clarence Hurt shot twice, Charles Winstead three times, and Herman Hollis just once. Dillinger was hit from behind and fell face first to the ground. He was struck four times, with two bullets grazing him and one causing a superficial wound to the right side. The fatal bullet entered through the back of his neck, severed the spinal cord, passed into his brain and exited just under the right eye, severing two sets of veins and arteries. An ambulance was summoned, though it was soon apparent that Dillinger had died from the gunshot wounds. He was officially pronounced dead at Alexian Brothers Hospital. According to investigators, Dillinger died without saying a word. Dillinger was shot and killed by special agents on July 22, 1934, at approximately 10.40 p.m. according to a New York Times report the next day. Dillinger's death came only two months after the deaths of fellow notorious criminals Bonnie and Clyde. Two female bystanders, Teresa Paulus and Edna Natowski, were wounded. Dillinger bumped into Natowski just as the shooting started. Natowski was shot and was subsequently taken to Columbus Hospital. There were reports of people dipping their handkerchiefs and skirts into the pool of blood that had formed as Dillinger laid in the alley as keepsakes. Sickos. Winstead was later thought to have fired the fatal shot and as a consequence, received a personal letter of commendation from J. Edgar Hoover himself. Dillinger's body was available for public display at the Cook County Morgue. An estimated 15,000 people viewed the corpse over a day and a half. As many as four death masks were also made. On July 24th, the body was returned to Mooresville. It was put on exhibition at intervals during the evening to satisfy the curiosity of the crowd. The next day at 2 p.m., funeral services were held at the home of Audrey Hancock, Dillinger's sister in Maywood. Dillinger's gravestone has been replaced several times because of vandalism, by people chipping off pieces as souvenirs. When Dillinger escaped from the Crown Point Jail, he actually took the sheriff's car, a V-8, belonging to the Chief Law Enforcement Officer, Sheriff Lillian Holly. When the car was discovered later, Sheriff Holly stated that she didn't want it back. Some say the theft of the sheriff's car was another dig Dillinger made against the sheriff for claiming that her jail was inescapable. Others say it was just the only V-8 available at the time. Although the FBI deported Anna Sage despite the deal that they made with her, on December 15, 1934, pardons were issued by Indiana Governor Harry G. Wesley for the offenses of which Anna Sage was convicted on November 24 and April 16, 1931. Hey, if you want to support this channel, we're on FB, Facebook, Twitter, Buy me a cup of coffee, paypal.com and gofundme.com. Oh, until next time.